Case 5, this is a 38-year-old who has chronic sinus complaints, uh, recently has noted multiple firm masses in his neck and over his body. The patient has a long history of dental problems and actually has had multiple dental extractions because of this. CT examination of the sinuses was ordered. Here are some representative axial as well as the generated coronal reconstructed images. And here are some images from the patient's head and neck CT examination. Some more axial sections of the lower mid-face. Which statement best describes the sinus lesions? Heterogeneous soft tissue masses, mucosal lesions, leave me alone, it's Friday, or discrete rounded bony masses? Please enter your choice. I'm counting on a three here. Ooh, somebody did it. Good. 73% of you feel that these are discrete rounded bony masses, and that is indeed true. Please note this very nice, discrete, and fairly impressively dense appearance of these rounded sinonasal mass lesions. Next question. Which statement best describes the soft tissue lesions? We're talking about the soft tissue masses this patient has now. Do you feel that they're heterogeneous? They represent diffuse lymphadenopathy. They are markedly enhancing and infiltrative masses, or they are minimally enhancing well-defined masses. Please enter your choice. Ninety-six percent, again, feel that these are minimally enhancing, well-defined lesions. I think that is quite characteristic and nicely depicted as seen here on this axial CT exam. Very discreet, almost like it was drawn on with a pencil. No infiltration of adjacent soft tissue and not much in the way of enhancement. You can certainly appreciate this as a post-contrast section. This patient has Gardner's syndrome. And uh, invariably, the uh, MOC likes to ask a few syndromic questions, so I thought one was important. The paranasal sinus, sinonasal problems, these patients are multiple osteomas. Why is this Gardner syndrome? These patients have sinus osteomas in conjunction with a bone disease. They have a bone dysplasia as well and multiple soft tissue tumors. Gardner syndrome represents a variant of familial adenomatous polyposis. Uh, it is autosomal dominant. These patients present with GI polyps, multiple osteomas, and skin and soft tissue tumors, or classically desmoid tumors. The cutaneous features or uh, findings, excuse me, in these patients include multiple epidermoid cysts, multiple desmoid tumors, but very often other benign soft tissue lesions. Here's the caveat of these patients, the 100% risk of these polyps within the GI tract of undergoing malignant transformation. Osteomas must be present to make the diagnosis of Gardner syndrome. Within the head and neck, we find the mandible is the most common location of these osteomas, but they may occur in the skull, sinuses, and actually in long bones as well. This is very important. If I can give you one pearl today, this will be the one. Osteomas actually precede the clinical and radiologic evidence of colonic polyposis. Make this diagnosis, you can save a life. So Gardner syndrome, multiple polyps within the GI tract, that 100% chance of turning malignant and these small osteomas that very often will be evident on head and neck examinations. Move to case six, this is a 14-year-old male, has some intermittent epistaxis and some nasal stuffiness. CT examination was performed. Here are some representative post-contrast axial images. Coronal reformatted images from that same examination. And again, sagittal reconstructed images from that exam. So here with the representative section, let's do the first question. Which statement best describes this lesion? An expanse off sinonasal mass lesion with modest enhancement, choice one. An enhancing mass that has aggressive features centered at the sphenopalatine foramen. A nasal septal mass with calcifications. Or a sphenoid sinus mass with relative low density center. Please enter your choice. Uh, 
That's kind of funky. I like that. Audience response says 88% of you feel that this is an enhancing mass with aggressive features that's centered at the sphenopalatine foramen. Here's the tergopalatine fossa. And at its aperture into the nasal cavity, we find the sphenopalatine foramen and this lesion centered at that location, widening and expanding into the tergopalatine fossa, actually into the nasopharyngeal masticator space, and secondarily involving the sphenoid bone with destructive changes. So for this case, which do you feel is the most likely diagnosis? Inverting papilloma, squamous cell carcinoma, juvenile angiofibroma, inflammatory polyp, or please end this now. A number of you thought five was the appropriate answer. And I can appreciate that, thank you. 85% of you feel this is juvenile angiofibroma. And that is indeed the correct answer. Inverting papilloma uh, likes the posterior lateral nasal wall, but typically in an older population. Uh, Middle-aged to elderly male patients are classic. Squamous cell carcinoma um, it certainly has aggressive features, and we think of squamous cell carcinoma, but squamous cell carcinoma, as we talked about earlier, older patient range, liking the maxillary sinus and maxillary antrum preferentially, um, and this extension into the PPF, not the characteristic feature, certainly with this widening. Inflammatory polyposis, while it can sometimes have a, a expansile changes, very unlikely to, to result in significant bone destructive changes. This indeed is juvenile angiofibroma. So why this case is a juvenile angiofibroma? The characteristic location here gives you that diagnosis. A young male patient with epistaxis with a lesion centered at the sphenopalatine frame and extending into the PPF, widening the PPF, that's juvenile angiofibroma with a high degree of certainty. Erosion of the sphenoid bone occurs very early in this disease process. It can lead to some difficulty in the surgical resection. Interestingly enough, Hippocrates actually described juvenile angiofibroma in the fifth century BC, uh, but he did not call it a juvenile angiofibroma, that term first utilized by Dr. Friedberg in the 40s. Again, isolated to male patients, and certainly, um, if we, you know, the characteristic thing that everyone's always been told is if you find this lesion and it's a female, you need to get bar bodies because you're not really sure that it is indeed a female. These lesions oftentimes demonstrate fairly impressive clinical response to estrogen therapy. And again, that origin here, the sphenopalatine frame, is very characteristic. How do these lesions spread here on MR examination, a fairly characteristic lesion, blowing out through the pterygopalatine fossa into the nasopharyngeal masticator space, extending back posteriorly into the coin and actually sometimes into the nasopharynx? Here, this lesion actually filling the nasopharynx, resulting in bilateral mastoid opacification, mastoid effusions because of the bulk of disease in the nasopharynx. On the coronal image, or excuse me, on the sagittal images here, nicely depicted that this patient actually has gross disease in the coanin and actually extending down towards the oral, oropharynx, as well as disease that has invaded the sphenoid bone into the inferior orbital fissure. Cavernous sinus involvement can be seen in this disease because of that propensity to involve the central skull base diffusely. And here's a wonderful feature if you're doing this exam routinely, the hypervascularity with salt and pepper changes on uh, T1 or post-contrast T1 or even T2 images. And here on the MRA, this markedly enlarged internal maxillary artery feeding that large juvenile angiofibroma. So I guess I pretty much did it on time. Uh, my conclusions, looking at the clinical data and imaging findings, you can do relatively well with uh, differential finding, differential diagnoses. Many of these ENT conditions have characteristic imaging appearances, and we can make a reasonable diagnosis. CT and MR, I think, are great things to have in combination. And finally, it's fun to be alive. And I will move from the